Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is John Bagnulo, and thank you for joining us in today's discussion on the influences that glyphosate has on a variety of different biological systems and how that might impact, uh, in addition to soil health, human health. Uh, I am the director of nutrition for functional formularies. We manufacture uh, the world's only organic whole food enteral formula and uh, I really am uh, hopeful that you can make these webinars a, a regular part of your ongoing education. One of our missions as a company is to raise awareness around a variety of social and environmental and health issues and this is certainly very high on that list. So that being said, uh, because we only have so much time together, I, I really want to embark on this. And I want to first, you know, if I can, bring your attention to what glyphosate really is. Glyphosate is an herbicide um, whose application, it's now the number one used in terms of tons that are applied to crops globally. It is the number one agrochemical uh, used today globally. Uh, its rate of use has increased steadily. Um, initially, it was only used with uh, genetically modified crops that were bred to be resistant to this herbicide, but now it's used in a variety of other applications that it was not intentionally uh, designed to be used for. I want to say, um, as we go on into this talk, I want to say first and foremost, this is not a talk about genetically modified organisms or GMOs. This is not a talk about GMOs, GM agriculture. This is a talk about glyphosate, the herbicide, which is used, of course, in conjunction with genetically modified crops. But I am not uh, discussing anything about genetically modified crops. This is only about the chemical glyphosate. I find it very interesting that the research around glyphosate, whether it is um, you know, the World Health Organization's classification of glyphosate as a probable carcinogen. If you are not familiar with this, you could look at the IARC's report um, from March 20th, 2015, which gives a long history of glyphosate research and why it is now considered a probable carcinogen. You know, it's just amazing when you take a look at all of this research, which has been done you know, primarily in the way of animal studies showing adverse influences on a variety of different biological systems within those animals. I find it very interesting that there is such strong opposition to that research by the industry, by various segments of the agriculture and chemical industry. Um, you know, what is it that makes these segments of, of industry feel so threatened about this potentially very, very significant public health threat. Um, most of the research, the vast majority of research that is done on glyphosate and the influence that it has on human health is done by nonprofit organizations who have no vested interest in this agrochemical. Um, organizations like Moms Across America, Food Democracy Now, even companies like our own uh, here at Functional Formularies, we have no vested interest in trying to raise the awareness around this chemical. Um, we don't benefit from that financially. We simply are concerned about the influences that this is most likely having on various uh, you know, demographics of our population. So I, I want to put that out there because it's a really important question we ask ourselves. Why is there so much opposition to being more vigilant around the glyphosate levels in drinking water supplies, in our food supply, of course, um, and, and around what's being shown in terms of human blood, urine tests, it's, you know, it's, it's really clear now that it's, we have widespread exposure through a variety of different vectors in our environment, not just our food, but of course that being a, a significant one. So you know, with that being said, and, and, and making sure that people ask themselves that question, let's take a look at where it's showing up and what are the primary sources of exposure. It is being found in drinking water supplies. Uh, primarily in and around areas that have uh, significant agricultural activity, especially with those aspects of agriculture where grain or cereal products as well as legumes are being grown. Those are 
the crops which tend to have the most intensive glyphosate use. Um, if we take a look at commonly consumed, and th these results are, were done by Food Democracy Now, you can see that a lot of common breakfast cereals have very, very high levels, um, many snack products as well. And these are all foods which typically have very, very high wheat, barley, corn, and in some cases legume contents. So these are some of the, and these are very, very high levels. We'll get to the, what these exposure levels actually mean here in a moment. Again, you can see that some of the products have you know, levels that are in excess of 800 parts per billion and at 0.1 parts per billion, at 0.1 parts per billion. Um, and these are again, 800 parts per billion. If we go back, you can see that Cheerios, for instance, were at you know, over 1,000 uh, parts per billion. At 0.1 parts per billion, that's five micrograms per liter if we were taking a look at things in a uh, volume uh, type of ratio. So five micrograms per liter is at 0.1 parts per billion. So when you start to get into levels like we're seeing here with many commonly co consumed foods, it's, you know, it's really alarming when you take into account what has been shown with incredibly low doses. Now, the study that is at the bottom uh, of this slide, which is a, a fairly recent investigation, showed that levels of 0.1 parts per billion, or five micrograms per liter of drinking water, when given to when given to rats, uh, caused excessive levels of liver inflammation and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, this is you know very interesting because we know that. There are a variety of different factors that influence liver health, um, some of which uh, originate within the gut or the GI, um, very important enzymes required for detoxification uh, have been shown in animal studies to be dysregulated, so to speak, by glyphosate exposure. And when we take a look at what is allowed in terms of glyphosate exposure here in the United States, the levels are at milligrams per kilogram of body weight here in the U.S., 1.75, whereas in Europe it's at 0.3. Um, and both of these, however, are much, much greater than the very, very low levels of exposure that were used in this very recent investigation in, in that animal trial. Now, again, we don't have cause and effect uh, evidence with respect to these human disease patterns like the incredible epidemic we have now here in the United States with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease starting at around the mid-1990s to current times we've had an explosion in number of, uh, of or percentage of our population that has it. That's not to say that we have cause and effect between glyphosate, that type of research. This is a very, very strong relationship that we're seeing if we were to plot these both on a similar axis. And that's really the, the critics of, uh, of this, you know, would simply say that this is just an association. I'd be the first to agree with that. This is called a Pearson strength of correlation. Um, and we have that for a variety of different aspects or health conditions and the use of glyphosate. But these are just important questions to ask. You know, much of what we're going to get to in today's discussion have been the results of animal investigations or trials. But this is just an interesting uh, you know, part of this discussion to consider is when we take a look at the emergence of glyphosate in our food supply, we start to look at various conditions, whether it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or later we'll take a look at autism. It's very interesting to see that there are some, some strong parallels that one can draw when looking at these uh, different patterns. Now, I mentioned that Glyphosate was originally developed to be used in conjunction with those crops that are genetically modified to be glyphosate resistant. Now, however, glyphosate is being used on many non-genetically modified crops. So once again, I want to reiterate this because I feel like there is also an incredible amount of confusion around this. You can have a very, very high level of glyphosate exposure in your diet. Any population can have glyphosate in its diet without ever consuming a genetically modified food or crop. This is because glyphosate is now being sprayed intensively 
on crops to desiccate them or dry them in the field. This crop desiccation or browning as it's known is used to accelerate the, uh, the harvest procedure here, whether it's with a grain or a legume, and the crops are dried in the field because glyphosate will, will kill a plant that is not genetically modified uh, to be resistant to it. So it's a way for, uh, for farms or, or farmers to dry crops, desiccate them in the field to speed up this process prior to harvest. And this has resulted in widespread glyphosate use and being used in levels that it was never approved for initially in terms of its, uh, its, its use here being approved for safety purposes. Now, how is it that glyphosate works? Well, it disrupts the shikimate pathway in plants, which means it prevents plants from producing the aromatic or benzene ring containing amino acids, which are tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. These are really important amino acids for plants um, because they allow plants to produce a variety of substances that range from antioxidant-like polyphenolic substances, which most often help a plant defend itself against a variety of different pressures within its environment. And, and for, you know, for the most part, when scientists come to the defense of glyphosate with respect to its low level of toxicity in terms of human health or animals' health, what what these scientists most often or almost always cite is the fact that humans and other mammals do not require the shikimate pathway. We get our amino acids from the food that we eat. What they fail to recognize time and time again is that while we as mammals may not require the shikimate pathway, we are to no small extent an enormous byproduct of the microbes that live within our GI. And almost all of these microbes within our gut require that shikimate pathway to have a functional population that again has a profound influence on our health in many ways. That is an enormous component of today's talk is how is it that glyphosate disrupts the GI, the gut environment in that very, very critical ecosystem. System. And it happens at very, very small concentrations of glyphosate in the diet. So other mechanisms for this very glycine-centric uh, herbicide is that not only does it disrupt the shikimate pathway, critical for plants, but again also critical for the microbes within our microbiome, it also has influences on gene expression and it has profound influence on soil health and soil characteristics, in particular the way that trace minerals are bound or chelated within the soil, which means that the amino acids in the soil can become chelated or bound with glyphosate application, making them very, very difficult for plants to take up into their physical structure. This, of course, influences what we or the animals that were to consume those plants would have available in the way of micronutrients. So we have a reduction in the bioavailability of critical trace minerals when the soil contains glyphosate. Now that shikimate pathway, if we take a look at just phenylalanine, for instance, phenylalanine is required by plants to produce anthocyanins, uh, flavonoids, a variety of very, very important antioxidant, anti-inflammatory uh, acting compounds or phytonutrients in plants. That's just phenylalanine. Similar mechanisms would be shown with tyrosine or tryptophan. And again, when plants have a reduced ability to generate these multi-ringed aromatic amino acids, it compromises the plant's health in one way or another. This refers to the way that glyphosate chelates or ties up important minerals and trace minerals in the soil. Uh, researchers like 
Don Huber, uh, formerly of Purdue University, has shown this in, in some of his animal trials and has, has explained that reductions in fertility rates and animal health overall and the models of health overall, he feels, are most likely uh, tied to the reduced bioavailability of trace minerals when glyphosate is applied to the soil. Now, as I mentioned, the, the microbiota, that four to five pounds of bacteria that make up the mostly distal uh, area of our GI that have huge, huge influences on everything from the way lipids are metabolized to the gap junctions or the intestinal permeability of the GI to gene expression to the production of neurotransmitters. We know now from extensive research that this microbiota is heavily influenced by a number of different environmental and dietary factors. And then as that microbiota shifts towards a larger percentage of one population or smaller percentage of critical bacteria, that our risk for a variety of diseases changes with it. And you know, we, whether you're talking a look, whether you're talking about um, you know the, the just looking at pulmonary health, whether you're looking at asthma uh, and the presence of certain bacteria. We know that, for instance, Heliobacter pylori, uh, various members of the streptococci family, they have influences on a population's risk for developing asthma, whether their populations are larger or smaller. Um, certainly the same has been tr shown true with, with other aspects of lung health, and that's just looking at lung health with respect to the, the relationship it has to the, the microbes. Insulin resistance has even stronger relationships that have been established. And, and intestinal permeability, is a big part of this because many bacteria or families of bacteria play sentinel roles in governing gap junction uh, regulation. The, how large those gap junctions are and how well they're held together will allow certain substances into the bloodstream or into circulation that, that, that may, not, may not want, we would not want them to be there in larger concentrations. So this intestinal permeability is govern, governed by a large number of factors. An example of that would be gliadin. By now, most people are aware of the role that gliadin in individuals who have celiac disease, the role that that gliadin plays in governing intestinal permeability. Uh, it's not just for individuals with celiac disease, however. All humans, and, and most mammals for that matter, have been shown in a variety of investigations to have an immediate, immediate response when there's exposure to dietary gliadin where zonulin is secreted, the gap junctions start to widen as zonulin digests some of the tiny protein filaments that hold these, uh, these cells together. We have an increase in intestinal permeability. Now for those of us who are not celiac, those gap junctions are start to decrease in size and those cells come back together after a few hours uh, with which the gliadin has, has been eliminated from that intestinal environment. But for people with celiac disease, the gap junctions stay large and intestinal permeability stays high for prolonged periods of time, sometimes for weeks after exposure to gliadin. I'm only using this as an example to really illustrate the role that a variety of substances have on gut health and on, in particular, this this brush border barrier, which is a really critical part of who we are because three quarters of our immune system lies within a centimeter of, of this gut wall. And we now know through years of research that there are a wide variety of substances that play pivotal roles in regulating these gap junctions or the size of these gap junctions. And when it comes to microbes, they may be at the top of the list. Uh, bacteria like Fecobacter prosnitzii, for instance, which has an incredible amount of research supporting its pivotal role in maintaining good gut health and improving that intestinal wall health, make, maintaining tight regulation, primarily through its generation of n-butyrate or butyric acid. That's another fundamental part of today's discussion. So we know there are bacteria or families of bacteria that are really important in maintaining one aspect or more of gut health, and, and this would be a prime example of that. Now if we step back for a moment from hopefully now everyone being on board and understanding that the microbiome is a really important part of who we are and the health of any population, 
And now coming back to you know the role that glyphosate plays in, in influencing uh, human health and in particular the, the microbiome, we could take a look at Monica Kruger's work um, which has shown that glyphosate levels tend to go hand in hand, higher levels uh, being found in people who have chronic diseases and who have higher levels of inflammation, who have a greater level overall of disease state. So if we start to understand that there is widespread exposure to glyphosate, especially in certain crops and in certain aspects of agriculture, that individuals with more chronic disease, uh, more inflammation, tend to have higher levels of glyphosate when we test them, and that glyphosate has a profound influence on the microbiome, which we're going to get to now, we can start to understand that there are, there are these what we call plausible mechanisms, biological mechanisms being influenced by this herbicide. And let's take a look at you know, some of the, the richest sources which are going to be both non-GMO, and, and I hate to say it, but also organic uh, non-GMO grains. You can see that the levels range from 70 to 90 micrograms per kilogram to 30 to 60 when you get into organic grains. And then organic lentils, also you know, 16 of the 54 tested in Europe had very significant levels of glyphosate in them. Organic flax, 60 micrograms uh, per kilogram, 60 micrograms of glyphosate per kilogram of organic flax in terms of the organic flax uh, samples that were tested in northwestern United States and in Canada. And you know, Tony Mitra's uh, more recent investigation to this, if you're familiar with this, you know, really confirmed this, that Canadian flax and Canadian cereals and legumes also tested very positive, very high, high levels of glyphosate as well. So non-GMO soybeans, um, you know, very significant levels. You can see now we're not in the micrograms, but we're in the milligrams per kilogram level, which are very, very, very high levels of parts per billion. Um, these are, you know, again, these levels exceed what has been approved uh, not only for our drinking water levels, but, you know, for physiological exposure in a variety of different areas. And, you know, we start to... Think about all the different ways that these grain and cereal products are used in other aspects, whether it's feeding livestock for dairy production, for instance, or meat production, and all of the different ways that these grains are used to produce a variety of things, whether it's to beer or other foods that have large integral components of grains and cereals. 60 micrograms is a significant visible dose. This is what 60 micrograms uh, looks like of dry weight. So when we're talking about the amount, let's say, that's found in organic flax, these, these levels you can actually visibly see. They're, they're quantifiable. We're not talking about these in these you know, astronomically low exposure levels. These are levels that are much, much greater than what have been used at very low concentrations given to animals for, for longer periods of time. As I mentioned, you know, some of the more recent research showing effects on liver health, for instance. So what else has been found? Well, Moms Across America's initiative to, to have you know, volunteers come forth to have their urine tested, to have drinking water tests has shown that it is, again, uh, widespread in urine tests as well as in drinking water, and that this notion that we would not bioaccumulate glyphosate has been proven wrong, that we all are holding on to higher and higher levels with more and more glyphosate exposure, whether through whether it's through our food or through through our drinking water, um, it, it, it's it's widespread, it's pervasive, and it's unfortunately being shown to be at very very high levels in um, various aspects of of who we are, whether it's our urine, our blood, um, you know, based on the European investigations that looked at blood levels. And at very, very low concentrations, there are significant influences on gene expression all the way up through uh, and alterations in liver metabolites and the liver's ability to detoxify certain substances. So we've got the dose response in a variety of different areas. We've, we've got the fact that it is widespread in our food supply and in our drinking water. And now what critics of this are citing is a lack of human trials where humans are going to be given varying levels of glyphosate and then from that we will 
follow them and look at you know observing their health and looking at a variety of different outcomes and it's very unlikely that that research will ever occur because if the World Health Organization and the IARC have deemed it a probable carcinogen it's unlikely you're going to get any internal review board for any institution to approve research where glyphosate would be administered knowingly to a population thereby waiting for observed changes in health that won't happen given the fact that it's a probable carcinogen so it'll be a very very long time before uh, we have the, the type of human trials that the industry would accept and I you know we can look back over the course of uh, other other examples of environmental uh, cancer causing or harmful substances whether it be DDT or others in our environment the, the lag time between when it was first suspected when observations were made in terms of environmental exposure and how widespread it was and various patterns of diseases to where we you know had the, the body of clinical evidence that allowed the industry to finally uh, I would lack for better expression resign and say yes okay you know we, we accept the regulation and the same thing is unfolding here with glyphosate so you can see towards the bottom of this slide that glyphosate exposure in animal studies has been shown to have a suppression of very important families of bacteria such as bifidobacter and other other families lactobacilli strains as well that are important at regulating this microbiome or the ecosystem within the gut and you know that's a very very important part of regulating as I mentioned earlier the tight junctions that keep gut wall health in place you have a variety of substances whether it's the gliadin uh, in, in grains such as wheat um, other substances that have been shown to help you know break down through zonulin secretion that gut wall dysbiosis or having an imbalance of gut bacteria is really at the core of this and that's what we're talking about is that when bifidobacter in particular are compromised because they are incredibly sensitive to glyphosate exposure whereas other families of bacteria unfortunately such as the clostridium family which contains C. difficile uh, you know C. botulinum these, these members of the clostridia family are not sensitive to the glyphosate exposure that lactobacilli or bifidobacter families are and so there tends to be an overgrowth of those potentially pathogenic families and when that happens this big picture this perfect storm uh, in essence starts to become magnified or amplified and this has to do with the fact that many of these microbes in addition to if their families are lost we start to lose the ability to generate n butyrate or butyric acid we also start to have an increased emergence in the gut and in the physiology of these animals and in the case of humans higher levels of their metabolites these would be particular substances that some bacteria families such as the clostridium family tend to produce at higher levels and propionic acid is a prime example of that We'll get to that in just a moment. So these are families of bacteria which over the course of the last two decades researchers have found that when they start to disappear from the microbiome or the gut there start to be changes in an individual's risk for insulin resistance or obesity um, and then there are other populations that if they start to emerge at higher levels there is also uh, an increased risk for some of some of these different types of insulin resistance or what we call metabolic syndrome diseases and clostridium family is, is, is very well established as a, being a, a family of bacteria that would put a population at greater risk for member for different aspects of this metabolic syndrome so that would just be one example but we've already talked about fecobacter prosnitzi you can see that you have roseburia here as well as decreased populations of bifidobacter that we've talked about also um, being observed in those individuals or populations with a greater risk for insulin resistance and obesity so these these relationships also exist and, and this is an ecosystem so it isn't about any one particular family being there or not being there and again we don't have a certain percentage or ceiling with respect to physiological uh, changes we know 
that higher levels of clostridia are not good and that higher levels of clostridia in relationship to lower levels of bifidobacter produce poorer outcomes in populations whether we're looking at the metabolites present in an autistic population's blood or we're looking at a population's risk for insulin resistance or obesity. These relationships exist and it's part of the big picture ecosystem model that's really important to understand when we're talking about gut health. And the simplest way to understand that is if we were to remove bifidobacter, if we were to remove those populations, for instance, that are most sensitive to low levels of glyphosate in the gut with food or drinking water exposure, as those populations are removed, it's like removing a tertiary consumer in an ecosystem or the food chain. You're going to start to have imbalances and a disruption of that, which in essence is called dysbiosis in the gut. It's the exact same model we're talking about. And butyrate or N butyrate, butyric acid as it's known, is a four carbon short chain fatty acid that is produced by critical members of the microbiome. And the bifidobacter family is the absolute best example of this. And again, the bifidobacter family has been shown in animal studies to be incredibly sensitive to the presence of glyphosate at very low levels in the diet or the drinking water of these animals. As bifidobacter is decreased in terms of its presence in the, in the microbiome of these animals, it tends to be replaced by the clostridium family, which produces a very different type of short chain fatty acid known as propionic acid. That's a three carbon short chain fatty acid that has very, di very different effects on physiology and in particular the mitochondria, especially in individuals who are sensitive to propionic acid at higher levels in their blood. Propionic acid as a short chain fatty acid tends to impair carnitine dependent pathways within the mitochondria that allow for fatty acids in general and fat metabolism to take place in a way that supports the Krebs cycle or aerobic respiration generating an important influx of energy for the mitochondria. So not all short chain fatty acids are equal in terms of how well they support human physiology and in particular the mitochondria. And butyrate or butyric acid is the absolute most critical or essential type of short chain fatty acid and its production is compromised when bifidobacter and lactobacilli bacteria are removed from the microbiome. Again, this has been demonstrated with exposure to glyphosate. Those families of bacteria that do not produce N-butyrate or butyric acid, but that produce propionic acid, may in fact be part of this ongoing disruption with glyphosate exposure to the microbiome because as their populations increase, in the case of clostridia, you start to have higher levels of a type of short chain fatty acid being produced, which are very disruptive to mitochondrial health and have been implicated in the emergence of particular aspects of autism on the autism spectrum disorder. Children, for instance, with autism or who are on that spectrum tend to have clostridia overgrowth tend to have very lower, much, much lower levels of bifidobacter and have higher levels of circulating propionic acid as a function of having more clostridia. And this, again, compromises mitochondrial health, which is a big part of the neurological disruption in the case of autism and a variety of other conditions, diseases as well. If you want to look more at this research, I've cited some of, you know, some of those papers within this. And once again, I want to reiterate, we don't have cause and effect research with respect to glyphosate consumption and autism. So I am not saying that. And when you take a look at some of the relationships that have been, been depicted by individuals such as Nancy Swanson, this is one that is almost always criticized heavily by the chemical industry and by agribusinesses that 
again, use glyphosate as a big part of their uh, production as saying that this is not cause and effect and that it's poor science. I am not saying that we have cause and effect. What I'm saying is we have a very strong relationship between the application of glyphosate and particular conditions and diseases that have emerged to higher and higher rates or incidence levels within our population as we've used more and more glyphosate. And I think that we should ask very important questions when we take a look at the Pearson correlation coefficients that describe the strength of these relationships. Smoking in lung cancer has an R value or a Pearson's correlation coefficient of 0.75. And yet there are still people that say smoking does not cause lung cancer. So I will leave it at that, that we have a very strong relationship that exists between particular environmental exposures, particular aspects of lifestyle, and diseases. And while we do not have a cause and effect established between glyphosate exposure and autism, between glyphosate exposure and a disruption of insulin uh, sensitivity pathways between liver health, we are seeing an emergence in these diseases and with an increased use of glyphosate, with an increased presence of glyphosate in so many commonly consumed foods, in so many of our drinking water supplies, it begs an important question. Why are we not regulating its use with more scrutiny? Why are we not being more vigilant with respect to requiring testing of our food supply and of our drinking water supplies and making corrections that are necessary to amend this. You know, these are the questions that are unfortunately are not being asked. We are allowing glyphosate to be a big part of our food supply at higher and higher levels every year and we really have to change that until we find out as the industry argues for that it's not toxic. And I think that that's an important part of this conversation is that glyphosate has not been shown to be acutely toxic, which means you can consume glyphosate and not start to experience vomiting, nausea, or, th or a threat to life immediately. But that's very different than the type of long-term toxicity, carcinogenic disruption that occurs with prolonged exposure at much lower levels. So while it may not be toxic, to drink glyphosate, as is argued by, you know, again, advocates for its use, that is very, very different in terms of what happens when we're exposed to it and it has the ability to disrupt a variety of different systems. The, the difference between acute toxicity and long-term safety are very, very different. And again, I think there have been pro, you know, very, very significant efforts by pro-glyphosate use advocates in the industry to cite that research has shown it's non-toxic with acute exposure. We're talking about what happens when glyphosate exposure takes in place day in and day out because it's in our breakfast cereals and it's in our drinking water and it's in so much of our food supply. How is it we avoid exposure given what we know now around glyphosate consumption one of the best things we can do is try to follow the advice put forth by researchers such as Ian Spreadbury who have shown it's best if we reduce the amount of grain cereal products in our diet, period. When we do that, not only will we reduce our glyphosate consumption because that's where the majority of it is being used, either with genetically modified crops or in the browning or desiccation process, well the other benefits are to consuming less of a flour, processed grain, cereal type of diet is we're going to have very beneficial effects on the microbiota and we're going to change the families of bacteria that are ending up in the small intestine which are often referred to as common culprits in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. This means that a diet centered around grains and flour products tends to fuel the overgrowth of bacteria in that distal small intestine and then they generate lipopolysaccharides and substances that have been shown to, again, in addition to having the glyphosate concentrations in those grain products, 
they will also, just by the concentration of carbohydrate in an individual's diet, will also fuel dysbiosis to the point where gut wall integrity will be compromised. So there can be, in essence, death by a thousand cuts when we start to look at all of the different ways that the food supply influences the microbiome. This is yet another. And getting off of a grain or flour-based diet is going to have benefits in a variety of different areas. It's also important to have a wide variety of vegetables in our diet. Unfortunately, our microbiome gets a very monolithic type of carbohydrate, a very limited amount of fermentable fiber, and that also will compromise the families of bacteria that we want to feed or nourish to have higher levels of. And there are certain microbes that we need to acquire, if we can, through better or healthier soils. And there are a wide variety of these which have been shown to beneficially improve soil health and thereby remediate that soil which has been heavily treated with glyphosate. So there's a way, just as we want to feed important families of bacteria within our gut, we want to try to change uh, the microbial profiles of the soils in this country where a lot of our food is being grown. Reducing glyphosate exposure, in summary, would be eating a less grain-centric uh, diet, trying to get that to be a much smaller percentage of the food that we eat, choosing only 100% grass-fed animal products, whether we're talking about meats or dairy products, trying to source as much of our uh, poultry uh, to be grown without the use of soybeans, because soybeans have such high levels of glyphosate, whether they're genetically modified or not. Um, and then really trying to look at you know organizations such as the Environmental Working Group. It's a wonderful nonprofit organization which has rated those foods with the highest pesticide and herbicide levels, not just glyphosate, but others such as uh, atrazine, uh, paraquat, all of these other chemicals which we know are also uh, unfortunately being found at high levels in a lot of different fruits and vegetables and grain products. So prioritizing those foods um, that really should be organic or not produced with chemical intervention whenever possible. These are all ways that we can reduce the amount of glyphosate that we're going to uh, consume or our families are going to consume. Eating fermented foods regularly is a great way to improve those bacterial families which we know that can be compromised with glyphosate exposure. Doing all we can to uh, consider our, our intake of other important micronutrients as well, such as vitamin D, uh, acetyl L-carnitine, in case of you know, a population where there have been higher levels of glyphosate in their diet, this may be also a very beneficial addition to the diet in, in efforts to try to remediate some of the effects. And using probiotics, whether again through, that's through a fermented food or taking probiotics in capsule or powder form, these may, al may also be really important uh, steps that we could take to remediate gut health and try to improve overall uh, physiology with, with glyphosate exposure. So with that being said, I, these are some uh, references in addition to the ones that are cited within the body of this presentation that I think you could find very useful in trying to evaluate this uh, on your own in terms of how much of a public health threat glyphosate exposure is. We've discussed a variety of different mechanisms uh, this afternoon whereby glyphosate influences the microbiome, what's been shown in animal studies, and again, while this will undoubtedly be criticized for uh, the foreseeable future by those who uh, want glyphosate to continue to be uh, a regular and integral part of the way food is grown in this country, I think you should ask yourself the question after reviewing all this research based on what's been shown in animal studies, why would we continue allow it to allow it at the high levels that it is being used? Why would we find it acceptable that most of the common breakfast cereals and grain products that our children are consuming today contain such high levels in comparison to what's been used in animal studies at very, very low dosages, uh, producing very unfavorable outcomes in those animals. Why would we continue to allow that? Um, it's just, you know, it's, I think it's an important question to ask that's not being asked enough. And I, that's really the way I want to leave it this afternoon. Um, again, I, I hope that you found this informative that it's maybe shifted your perspective
um, or your family's or, or loved one's perspective, or maybe your patients if you're a clinical provider on this as a public health issue. And I in invite you to join us uh, for future webinars. We have one coming up on February 7th on the topic of inflammation and how that influences immune system activity. We hope to offer these webinars every month. And I want to thank uh, not only Functional Formularies for their work in, in raising our level of consciousness around these issues, but also Moms Across America as a, as a wonderful organization that also is really trying to help families understand how it is they can change uh, their children's health or the potential for their children's health with some of these changes. So with that being said, thanks a lot for being with us today, and I look forward to talking with you in the future. Take care.